Hi, this is David Bedford and welcome back to another look at Beatles history. Today we're going to look at the 6th of June 1962, one of the most important dates in Beatles history. Positive, it was the audition for George Martin at Parlophone. The negative, of course, it's the beginning of the end for Pete Best. Now, I've done a separate video all about whether the Beatles were under contract or whether this was an audition. And with legal proof, we proved it was actually an audition. If you want to find out more about that, then um, have a look at this video. But let's concentrate on the day itself for this one. Now, of course, we're looking at the Beatles get invited down by George Martin to take a look. But George Martin wasn't there for a lot of the session. Most of the session was produced by Ron Richards, who was a hands-on producer. George Martin himself was in the canteen. He had other work to do. So they had the engineers there as well, Norman Smith and Ken Townsend. So they've got a lot to say about what happened in the session. So let's look back at that day, 6th of June 1962, what really happened. So Norman Smith said, They had really duff equipment, ugly unpainted wooden amplifiers, extremely noisy with earth loops and goodness knows what. The noise coming from the amplifier, specifically the bass amp built for Paul by Adrian Barber in Liverpool, was particularly bad. They also had to tie string around John Lennon's guitar amplifier to stop it rattling, and a problem with Pete Best cymbals as well. So equipment wise, it wasn't a great start. So they hadn't learned some of their lessons from Decker at that point, but that wasn't all. They were nervous. As Paul said, Studio Two was like this cavernous room and he recalled it had an endless stairway up to the control room. It was heaven where the great gods lived and we were down below. Oh God, the nerves. So Paul, as you may well know, a Decker was really nervous and his voice was so shaky it was a poor performance on that day it didn't improve a lot on the 6th of june now of course a lot of what we know is the only uh, songs that survived best may mucho and love me do and what we sort of judged the day on but there was actually a lot more that went on so they had a quick rehearsal but then a bit like with decker brian had drawn up a list and this time he was asked by george martin to identify who the singers were because he was trying to decide should it be paul mccartney and the Beatles or John Lennon and the Beatles they needed a leader who was it going to be so this is the list of all the songs they did so they had a suggested opening melody Best of My Mucho sung by Paul Will You Love Me Tomorrow sung by John Open Your Loving Arms sung by George and then they were separated and we don't know the exact order but we know that for Paul it was P.S. I Love You Love Me Do Like Dreamers Do Love of the Loved Pinwheel Twist and it should be noticed that Love Me Do um, was normally sung by John, but it's under Paul under this list. Um, if you've got to make a fool of somebody, till there was you, over the rainbow, your feet's too big, hey baby, dream baby, September in the rain, honeymoon song. And of course, picking up on uh, doing hey baby, because that was the song with that great harmonica. That is sort of was the latest trend, which proved to be very important in them getting the deal. Then for John, we've got Ask Me Why, Hello Little Girl, Baby It's You. Please, Mr Postman, to know her is to love her. You don't understand, or I just don't understand. Memphis, Tennessee, Shot of Rhythm and Blues, Shimmy Like My Sister Kate, Lonesome Tears in My Eyes. Then for George, we've got A Picture of You, Shake of Araby, What a Crazy World We Live In, Three Cool Cats, Dream, Take Good Care of My Baby, and Glad All Over. Now it's interesting when we look at this list, 10 of these songs they sung at the Decker audition, which of course they'd failed. So they were still performing these and still thought they were good enough for this audition. We know that obviously the Beatles become famous for their original songs, but only seven of this total list of songs were original compositions. Paul's got 14 songs, John's got 10, George has got seven. So when we go from this list, Ron Richards, obviously having heard all these songs, has selected only four to record. Best Me Mucho, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, and Ask Me Why. Now I know Love Me Do becomes the one that everybody sort of hangs Pete's career on, but there must have been something in that song at that time which Ron Richards thought was good enough to be selected for one of the four to record. When they were going through this, the tape operator, Chris Neal, 
when he listens to Love Me Do and that whining harmonica, he thinks, this sounds interesting. And is told, let's go and get George Martin. So this is at the point at which George Martin is brought into the audition. So he hadn't heard all the rest that had been going on. That wasn't his job. He wasn't worried about that. But it's that harmonica of John's that then brings George Martin to the session. But that then brings another problem. Because, of course, Paul gets really nervous. So let's take a look at the song of Love Me Do. Now, it's interesting, uh, Pete's comments on this when he's asked about it. And Pete Best says, you can't really compare the version they did then and what later became their first single. We've been doing it in Hamburg for the German fans and we tried a few variations and it went down well. It's one of those early songs they'd actually um, revived with a few changes. And Pete said, what you have to remember is that it was only done a couple of times for the edification of George Martin and the sound engineers to let them know what the song was like. So let them think about it for the next time we came back and have an idea of what the arrangement was. You have to listen to it and realise it's not a finished recording, more like a glorified demo. The song changed a lot under George Martin from the way the Beatles, not me, but the group, had performed it. We did it slower and a change of beat was put in because it was fascinating to the audience. So that's interesting again to see how the Beatles have put this together. Because obviously Pete Best wasn't the arranger within the group, was he? As we know, the way it went was whoever wrote the song tended to make the arrangement. So this would have been an arrangement the group had come up with. Now, they'd only revived it a matter of two or three weeks before this audition, while they were out in Hamburg. So it was a new arrangement. And it's interesting, there is a clip of the Beatles with Ringo towards the end of 1962, performing Love Me Do. And he does have a variation on the skip beating. And in 1964, in a cover band, Jimmy Nickel, who of course played with the Beatles on the World Tour in 64 when he stood in for Ringo, he did a cover version of Love Me Do. He also adds a variation of a skip beat in there as well. So it's obviously it was something to play with to make the song a little bit more interesting. But anyway, back to the audition. George Martin realises there's an issue. Because when John's singing it, and playing the harmonica, of course, they were recording it live. And so John is sort of saying, love me, wah, 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 on the harmonica. And George Martin said, whoa, 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 hang on a sec. You can't be doing that. You can't do both. Paul's going to have to sing the line. God, I got the screaming heebie-jeebies, he said. I mean, he, George Martin, suddenly changed this whole arrangement that we've been doing and John was to miss out that line. He sing please, put his mouth all into his mouth. I sing love me do, and John would come in, wow wow wow, with the harmonica. We were doing it live. There was no real overdubbing, so I was suddenly given this massive moment on our first record, no backing, where everything stopped. The spotlight was on me, and I went in a shaky singing voice, love me do. Paul didn't like that, and you can tell on that audition, his nerves are there. But to be fair to all of them, they were all nervous. They're in this proper recording studio. They'd only done it once before at Decca and failed. So they were nervous and they all got nervous. But they tried not to show it. They tried to put a bit of bravado on for the lads. But when it came to the end of the session, Ron Richards, who'd been producing the whole day, his thoughts were, mm, I probably wouldn't have signed the Beatles. Norman Smith said, they didn't impress me at all. And George Martin, on listening to the playback, said, they were rotten composers and their own stuff wasn't any good. Thankfully for them, the personalities were, as we know famously in the control room afterwards, George Martin gave them this long discussion for 20 minutes, pointing out this is how the recording industry works, etc. And says, right, is there anything you don't like? And George Harrison famously yeah, says, well, I don't like your tie. It broke the ice. And then he went into this goonish conversation where they were laughing and laughing. And I think for Norman Smith, for George Martin, Ron Richards, there was something in the personalities, particularly of John Paul and George, that they warmed to. It wasn't the music necessarily that grabbed them, but they had a certain something. But of course, as we know from evidence, this is the day when everything changes for Pete Best. Up until that point, there hadn't been anybody properly questioning his role in the group. But now, yes, George Martin makes some comments. But he was passing on the comments of Ron Richards. It was Ron Richards who actually made the decision. 
Ron Richards goes to George Martin and says, it was probably me that had the problem because I had a thing about drummers. Drums were a big thing with me and I think I was asking him to play a certain beat and he couldn't cope. He couldn't do it. Exactly what I wanted. And I got a bit, oh God, yeah, where do we go from here? But come to think of it, if I'd asked Ringo to do it, he couldn't have either. So Ron Richards, like many producers at the time, was thinking, I need you to do this in this way, in the studio, at short notice, quickly. Live drummers weren't used to that, which is why session musicians were used on so many records. But of course, the Beatles didn't know that, did they? How about Norman Smith? Now, Norman Smith, as well as an engineer, was also a drummer. And as he said, it wasn't how he was playing Pete Best, but what he was playing. I had my own jazz quintet and was used to arranging, but I was only the sound engineer. It was nothing to do with production at that time, so I didn't say anything. Ken Townsend, the other engineer, also didn't see a problem with Pete. I personally didn't see a reason for any session drummer to be brought in. So, what happens? There's got to be a decision. And this is the one that changes Pete Best's life and the story of the Beatles forever. Now, this is what George Martin said. At the end of the test, I took Brian to one side and said, I don't know what you're going to do with the group as such, but this drumming isn't good enough for what I want. It isn't regular enough. It doesn't give the right kind of sound. If we do make a record, I'd much prefer to have my own drummer, which won't make any difference to you because no one will know who's on the record anyway. So there you go, that's what George Martin says. As many A&R producers would have said at the time, okay, you've got a great band and they've got a nice following, fair enough, but when it comes to the studio, I need something very precise, something specific, and it's a certain skill set. So George Martin needed a session drummer. Didn't matter what happened as a live group. Now, Paul McCartney was uh, talking to Mark Lewison in the Beatles recording sessions, great book. And he recalled what George Martin had said. This was in front of John and George as well. Pete was out of the room. George Martin took us aside and said, I'm not happy about the drummer. He said, can you change your drummer? And we said, well, we're quite happy with him and he works great in the clubs. And George said, yes, but for recording, he's just got to be a bit more accurate. Okay, so the conversation has started about the drummer. But that's not all there is. That obviously sows the seed of doubt in the minds of John, Paul and George. If George Martin is going to use a session drummer because he doesn't think Pete can do what they needed to, what choice have they got? And this is what Paul says. Well, no, we can't do that, can we? It was one of those terrible things you go through as kids. Can we betray him? No. But our career was on the line. Maybe they were going to cancel our contract. And this is the big thing about this day. The reason it was an audition. Because George Martin comments were always, if we make a record, if I give you a contract. Everything was hanging on this. This was the very last chance to get a recording contract. Everybody else had turned them down. If they didn't get this, this was the end of the road for the Beatles. If the only way to get that contract was, in their eyes, to replace the drummer, that's what they had to do. It was a business decision. And really, for these young lads, you can't blame them. If George Martin has raised these queries, well, what could they do? They had to make a decision. Now, obviously, we're going to why Pete was fired or wasn't fired. And there's another video on that if you want to see. But George Martin wasn't saying, get rid of the drummer. And in fact, he made a very interesting observation because after the audition, he went up to Liverpool and he watched the Beatles play at the Cavern. And at the Cavern, he said, they were very raucous. The kids loved every minute of it. The rock and roll gyrations of Tommy Steele and, and Cliff Richard were clinical, anemic, even anaesthetic, compared with the total commitments of the Beatles. And as George Martin said in his autobiography, a group they were and a group they had to stay. So George Martin didn't have a problem with Pete Best in the Beatles, and he thought they were a great live act. And as we know, he wanted to almost make the first album a reflection of that great live act that he'd seen. But of course, when John Paul and George walk into 
in my studios on the 4th of September 1962. Nobody had thought to tell George Martin they changed the drummer. He was very surprised that Pete Best wasn't there. But sadly, this is the day that everything changed for Pete. That is what the evidence says. And the only reason that they decided they had to replace Pete was because George Martin, via Ron Richards, had decided Pete wasn't going to play on that first record. But they didn't make any changes until they got that contract through. And that contract didn't come through until about the third week of July. So they had to wait and wait and wait. Once that was through, then they proceeded to find other people to replace Pete. And of course, as we know, as of the four people who were asked, Ringo was the guy who said yes. And really, it couldn't have worked with anybody else. But this was the great day for the Beatles and the beginning of the end for Pete Best. What a story. See you next time.